Introducing Nose to Tail, a podcast where we explore the world of aviation lifecycle solutions, insights, and more. Presented by Jet Midwest. Welcome to Chicago, MRO Americas. I'm here with longtime friend John DeZuba from Diversified Aero Services, DASI. John, how you doing? Good, but we dropped Diversified Aero Services about 10 years ago. All right, so, so I'm an old friend. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying. So I warned you earlier, I was going to ask for your origin story. So yep. maybe you can help us out with a little bit of origin story on John. Sure. I grew up in an aviation family. My parents both worked for Eastern Airlines. So I grew up around aircraft. My dad was VP of purchasing. So uh, I got to see and do lots of cool things growing up. And I worked summer jobs for aviation parts companies, whether it was for somebody like you guys or doing bits of the business along, you know, each year, learning a little bit, sales, marketing, you know, accounting, warehouse, inventory control, and kind of put it all together and bought an inventory while I was still in college and started this company out of my college apartment. That was 31 years ago. Did you finish school? I did, yeah. Never never used much of it, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it did. did. You're not had, the first had, one. Had, had, had more fun than anything else. Yeah, well, that's okay, too. You know, and a well-rounded person is not a problem, right, in this business. I've just spent, you know, the first 10 years just trying to figure out, you know, how to pay bills. First thing I did was I leased a car that I couldn't afford that forced me. I had a bill that I had to pay at the end of each month. And otherwise, you know, just to give me that kind of that monkey in my back to make sure that I had to figure out one way or the other, I had to make 750 bucks this month that I could use to pay my car bill. And that's kind of how I started. It's awesome. You know, it really is an awful lot of entrepreneurs here in, in this aviation business, right? Whether they're small MROs, but a lot of people started from scratch, started very humble and worked their way up. If you could give yourself key points at the start of your career, what differentiated you? What gave you the advantage maybe in the way that you approach things in that first 10 years of your career? I think I had the advantage growing up of traveling a lot. So I was able to travel with my dad to various countries and you know see how business was done and kind of having that knowledge through today, right? Respect of other cultures, respect of how different business cultures, you know, your business conducted differently in different areas of the world. That's a huge advantage. And I think just persistence. I mean, you know, I didn't want to work for somebody and just getting out there and figuring out how to get things done, reinvent the wheel every step of the way. I probably could have cut 10 years off of the build cycle by going to work for AAR or somebody like that for, you know, for four or five years and building contacts and learning stuff. But I think that the company is stronger because I didn't do that because we had to figure out everything. I've done every job in the, in the company and it makes us stronger because of that. Now, as I recall, you actually wrote your original software yeah. Uh, and kept that for many, many Still years. Still parts of it, yeah. What was it like to be able to customize that in terms of its value to your organization? I mean, it was just necessity. I didn't have any money. I didn't know what an ERP was. I knew I had to invoice, create an invoice and a bill. So I just started to figure out, okay, how do I do that without spending a pile of money on something I don't understand or don't even know that I need? So that's kind of what drove me to start building what became our ERP. I just bought a book on Microsoft Access and started coding in SQL and creating, you know, as we needed the, the aspects of the software that, to do the things that we needed to do. So, again, kind of totally customized, totally user friendly, a little bit messy on the coding side, but, you know, it got the job done. But now we've kind of evolved past that. And I don't want to have my, I don't want to be involved with that kind of stuff anymore. Though. Well. Well, talk to me a little bit about, you know, from a, a technology standpoint, and you started with this self-developed system, yep. um, and you've transitioned. Tell me how that's affecting DASI and how you're growing and the things that are coming so now. What really drove the growth is, you know, I tend to like niche markets, and I've always stayed away from the big popular thing that everyone's doing. You know, when people are running out of a building, I'm running in to see what's going on and where there's opportunity. And I saw that in the lead up to the financial crisis, we had total irrational exuberance and purchasing everywhere. You had heaps of money flowing into the industry, kind of like today, a lot of public money coming in, a lot of hedge fund money. People were buying, overpaying for stuff. There was a bit of a feeding frenzy and I got nervous by that and started to focus on markets where nobody else was paying attention and consumables and expendables was kind of where I landed. In 2006, I changed all investment into consumables and expendables. And we grew that through 2010 and it had gotten so big that it was unmanageable. 
So I had to figure out, well, okay, now what do I do? I had to build a proper organizational structure and we need proper software and proper systems. So I started to look for ways to kind of leapfrog to the next level. And that's where doing an acquisition started to make sense. And 2013, we bought Aero Inventory out of uh, liquidation, which is the largest parts inventory, I think, to this day that's ever become available. We bought that inventory and that really changed us from a regional brand into an international brand and really solidified the focus on consumables and expendables. Going from there, now what do we do with this platform? We have all these parts, we have all these part numbers, and how do we monetize that deep into the future? So we started to think about what are customers looking for? Customers always tell us when we're visiting an airline, they want one invoice, one source. They don't want to have huge procurement departments dealing with brokers and multiple accounts. They don't particularly like dealing with the big OEMs. They would rather focus on a single source and a single invoice and have that all managed in one place. So that's really what we started to build was kind of a one-stop shop um, Amazon, is basically what it's modeled after, um, platform where we're aggregating suppliers, whether they're surplus suppliers or they're OEMs, distributors, everything in one place. So now on the platform today, we have over 2 million part numbers available. You can buy anything from Boeing's catalog through our platform, Safran, Parker, it's growing every day. So that's kind of been the future. With the acquisition of Aero Inventory in 2013, we picked up a web store and we've been growing that web store. So now 40% of our transactions happen online with no human interaction whatsoever. There's nobody else really doing that, certainly in the surplus space. And to us, that technology and that shift in the demographic of the market, because if you think about who's coming into the market these days, it's younger and younger generations. And the generations with the buyers that are buying the sub under $5,000 price point parts, they're the newest entrance into the market. So if you're buying a thrust reverser, it's going to be somebody like us. We've been around a long time. We know how to kind of play the market against each other and play buyers against each other. That's kind of the old fashioned way of buying. But if you're buying a bracket for a thousand bucks, you know, more than likely you're pretty young and you're used to doing everything online and right. you're looking for online solutions. And that's much more natural than picking up a phone and calling down an ILS list, trying to negotiate with people. So, yeah, um, absolutely. We've got a couple of C checks going on and my purchasing team has got you guys on the list. And every morning they run their entire list of everything they have. They don't even look, they just go straight to the web page and put it in and if the price fits in the category, they just buy it. And, it, and you're it's, right, it's so easy. It's like the easy button, right? Yeah. And, and you know, these lower price points, price sensitivity starts to fall away when you can get it everything in one place. When you go to Amazon, you don't really check to see if your toothpaste is 10 cents cheaper if you go directly to Target. You don't care, it's easy, you're there, you're buying a bunch of other stuff and that's kind of the same concept. So certainly with the growth of the material, uh, when you guys purchased your inventory, was there a team aspect or some internalized piece at Dossi that really changed? Certainly your whole organization changed at that point. You know, I saw it from the outside. Maybe you can give us more insight on the inside of how that changed. And, and well, it was chaos. We went from processing, you know, 30 orders a day to 300 orders a day overnight. And all of a sudden, oh, how the hell do we do that? And trying to figure out uh, build up the quality systems and the tracking, you know, processes and, you know, no one else was really, there was one other company at the time that was doing that. And so there's not a big pool of expertise out there. How do you do this in aviation? So we had to design all that. It took time and it was a challenge, but that's what really differentiates us today. Well, I know I got a tour of your facility a couple of years ago. I was really wanting to check out how you guys were handling order flow. You guys were marketing some of our material at the time, so that was beneficial for both of us. And so I was working through, and I have to say, I was blown away at the processes that your people were using, the flow of parts, the quality inspections, much more heightened than anything I'd experienced in terms of literally this dedicated crew that's handling all those transactions every day. They're yep. just experts sitting there all day long going through that quality process. And sometimes that's lost on people. Like you said, doing 30 inspections a day to 300, that, yeah. uh, that'd well, be huge. Now we're doing 600 a day. And if you screw up 1% of the 600, you've that's got, that's a lot of pissed off customers. And yep. those are the ones that they remember, right? So we have to shoot for 99.9% .9 accuracy. So. In order to do that, it requires a really robust quality system, really robust inspections and, you know, re-inspections and sampling and making sure that we're up to par because our buyers are buying from us because it's easy and because it's reliable. 
And it only takes a couple of screw ups before their boss says, what are you doing? Just go to Aniwa or just, just go to Boeing. Don't, don't, don't mess with these guys. That's why it's so important that orders that leave our facility that we own that are under our control have a very high level of accuracy and fulfillment. Working with the partners when Boeing is delivering something for us, maybe that's a bit more challenging because it's out of our control, but it's expectation management and working with the customers to make them understand that. We'll continue this discussion on the next episode of Nose to Tail, a podcast presented by Jet Midwest. Don't forget to please like and subscribe to our channel.